Today we are discussing the another scenario in RCC various uh, exam point of view scenarios. So thank you for the registrar who has kindly agreed to record the session so that it will be a good learning and revising resource for others. You are doing your post MDT clinic. There is a patient uh, belongs to your colleague discussed in the MDT. The MDT discussion states he is 65 year old. Performance status two because of his COPD and bronchial asthma. He also had past history of uh, valve replacement in the heart. The main lesion discussed is a large RCC, possible RCC lesion in the left kidney, which the MDT has discussed. The option is to discuss the patient's fitness and based upon the fitness to take the treatment further. How are you going to approach him in your post MDT clinic? Okay, and there was no signs of metastatic disease, uh, presumably. Yeah, just CT is normal. I can yeah. show you the renal CT. Give me a minute. I will okay. share that so that we can discuss that further before getting further. Okay. Are you able to see the pictures? Yeah. Yeah. So I'm showing you from anterior to posterior first. Mm -hmm. It's a left renal lesion. You can stop me if you want any time. Mm -hmm. Let's go Could through the, um, yeah. Let's go through this phase also before uh, we revise it again. Yeah, that's good. We're going from down to top. You can start narrating as you see. That's a good idea. Oh, okay, it's fine. Yeah. So, um, so we're we're looking at a, currently a urographic uh, axial CT, um, and I can see that the I mean, the most obvious abnormality is in, in the upper pole of the left kidney is a heterogeneous mass. Um, obviously, can't comment on enhancements on this phase, um, and I can see multiple bilateral hypoechoic areas, which probably cysts in the kidneys. Um, uh, it's difficult to comment on tumor thrombus uh, on this phase, um, but I can't see any obvious distension of the vein uh, or the cava. Um, and yeah, I can't see any obvious lymphadenopathy. Uh, okay, yeah, you're correct. Yeah. Go ahead. Um, and yeah, I can't I probably can't really comment on metastases on on this phase either. Um, but uh, and the contralateral kidney, apart from the this multiple cysts, uh, looks normal. Even in the same kidney, there are some multiple cysts. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so how are you going to proceed now? Um, so we uh, we've discussed him in NDT. So I, I'm seeing him back in clinic with, with the CNS to explain uh, the NDT findings regarding the the scan. Um, so I'd explain that he's got. Uh, a lump on his kidney um, and I'd explain that these things can be cancerous or they can be benign um, but at the, the the larger they are the, the higher the chance of them being cancerous so it's probably north of, of 80 85 um, percent in this case um, and I'd say that there are different options for treating it um, I would say that uh, one option would be surgery um, and um, in this situation, a radical nephrectomy would, would be an option, uh, which we can do um, with minimally invasive surgery, or we can do with an open approach. Um, I, I think um, partial nephrectomy probably wouldn't be the best option in this case, particularly given his comorbidities, um, and there's no real absolute indication to, to do so. Um, and there are other minimally, uh, sorry, there are other focal therapies which could be possible um how, how big did you say this tumor was sorry mr daniel taken it's uh, 11 centimeters okay i'll take that back there there, there, there are no uh, there are no focal therapies that would be appropriate um 
but yeah, the, the other option will be to, to treat things expectantly, meaning that uh, it will likely progress and get worse. But if he gets symptoms, then we could um, we could treat those if he believes, for example, we could do an embolization. Um, but those would be the options. Okay, so how are you going to proceed with this patient uh, in preparation for surgery? Yeah, so if he's uh, if we think he's fit enough and he wants to go ahead, I'd consent him in clinic um, using the bowel information leaflet, um, going through the risks, uh, benefits, complications, and the uh, alternatives. Um, and I'd explain the perioperative course. Um, so I think in this case, I think a hand assisted laparoscopic nephrectomy would be feasible. Um, and um, I'd explain that it would be a, a probably one or two nights stay in hospital. Um, and um, I'd explain the, the, the course from there. Okay. Uh, as I said, unfortunately, a significant pulmonary and cardiac illness. Cardiac illness is manageable. It's only a valve replacement. But pulmonary-wise, he's got uh, bronchial asthma and COPD. How will you optimize him? So I, I want to have him seen by an anesthetist. I, I want a formal assessment from an anesthetist. Um, I think we don't do this for every patient, but there's there's an argument if, if he's borderline for fitness to do CPEX testing. Um, to see if he's going to tolerate having laparoscopic surgery. Um, but if there isn't, uh, if, if he is reasonably fit, um, then we could always send him to the respiratory physicians um, to see if there's anything we can do to optimize him in terms of uh, his therapy for his COPD. Um, and postoperatively, we can put him on nebulizers. We can ensure he's got adequate chest physiotherapy. Um, those would be the main things. Okay. What do you mean by the CPEX testing? Um, so C CPEX testing is uh, cardiopulmonary exercise testing um, and it's essentially looking at a few factors um, but it's seeing how physiologically they'll tolerate their body being under stress. The key things that we're looking for uh, would be the anaerobic threshold. Um, so they're, in, in basic terms, they're, they're measuring their response to exercise and measuring the amount of oxygen they're taking in and the amount of uh, CO2 that they're producing. Um, and that they would measure the uh, point at which they reach an anaerobic threshold where the body transitions to anaerobic respiration. Um, we would set a point of about 11 to say that they are fit to have surgery. Um, if it's kind of between 8 and 11, we'd be going towards HDU and, and less than 8. Um, then it would be ITU and possibly thinking about alternatives to surgery in those patients. So why it is important, the anaerobic threshold? What happens when the patient in the anaerobic phase? So they, uh, the, the, the reason they're um, producing lots of CO2 is because it, without an anaerobic respiration, um, they're, um, yeah, they're, they're transitioning from the consumption of oxygen uh, into anaerobic respiration, which produces lactic, lactic acid. Um, so they'll become uh, acidotic and they then need to compensate for that by uh, um, buffering um, and that would re require increased respiratory effort. If they've got a very poor respiratory reserve, um, it would, as in this gentleman, then that's going to be a problem um, anesthetically. Okay, so the explanation what you can give is the aerobic metabolism is something like um, like driving a car in a very economical mode. So the amount of waste material or the end products produced is nicely excreted either by kidney or by the lungs in a very physiological manner. Once the patient heads up into the anaerobic phase, the amount of lactic acids, as you said, produced is overwhelmingly high for that particular patient's physiology, which results in using extra respiratory reserve, which is unfortunately not available, especially for our patient. So those are the conditions where patient will end up having a respiratory failure, requiring inability to exhibit in the post-op period or high dependency unit uh, movement to monitor more closely. So that's how the anaerobic phase is a bit unphysiological, but if the patient has some respiratory reserve, it could be manageable in a physiological manner. Okay. okay. Thank you. Good. So Thanks. this patient's CPEX testing shows he is on high risk, but uh, number one patient is happy to go ahead the, with the risk and undergo the radical nephrectomy because he knows that that's the only way he is going to successful and you have got good colleagues who can give you a multi-department support. How will you organize the cooperation and inputs from others and take it forward? 
So I, I'd liaise closely with the anaesthetist who's done the preoperative assessment. Um, as I say, you know, see if there's anything we can do to optimise them preoperatively. Um, and then um, I'd want to make sure that the anaesthetist on a day has been informed of the situation um, so that they can take appropriate measures. Um, I'd want to make sure that an intensive care bed has been organised because um, we're likely to need that post-operatively um, and um, associated respiratory support is needed um, in the post-operative period. Okay, so how will you take it forward? What kind of surgery you want to do for him? Um, yeah, I think I think uh, if he's if he's fit for it, a laparoscopic approach would be appropriate. We do it with a hand assisted approach in this case because uh, the tumor size and also um, I think we, we need to do the operation as uh, efficiently as possible to minimize operative time in this situation would be really important. Um, if the anesthetist has any concerns about doing it laparoscopically, then an open approach, um, I guess, would avoid. Uh, splinting of the diaphragm and, and high pressures, but then you're counterbalancing that with the um, uh, post-operative pain at atelectasis and loss of respiratory reserve from that, that region post-operatively. So that's something I'd discuss with the patient and the anaesthetist at, at length, I think, preoperatively. Um, and um, yeah, so if, if we're doing a hand-assisted approach, um, I would do it in the left lateral position after he's been catheterized um and um insert insert, insert my um camera port inspect the abdomen then insert my hand port um uh and my you know, gel um and then insert my working port um medialize the colon um dissect around uh the uh, uh regional hilum to get a win uh, mo mobilize the lower pole and then get a window on the upper pole um staple the renal hilum and then dissect the kidney um, divide the area to and take it out uh, and then close. Okay, the patient's tumor is on the left side. You said you will lie down the patient on the left lateral position. The, uh, sorry, so, so, sorry, say that again, Mr. Nasser. So no, the tumor the, is on the... the... tumor is on the left side and you said you will lie the patient on the left lateral position. Okay, just correct on that for the surgery. So, yeah, so uh, right left, so I, I want the left side up yeah. So right, uh, yeah. The patient will lie on the right lateral position. Right lateral position. Yeah. Good. Okay. Uh, fortunately, this patient has got uh, uneven full recovery from the surgery. His histology has shown twelve point three centimeter high grade undifferentiated RCC occupying most of the left kidney. No positive surgical margins and three lymph nodes in the right side hilar region showed positive lymph nodes. Adrenal was removed. Unfortunately, adrenal was involved with the RCC. What is the staging? How will you proceed further? Um, so he's got T4, um, N1, M0 disease. Um, he's going to have a, a high Leibovitch score based on all these factors. Um, so I'd want to follow him up quite closely um, with as per the EAU protocol uh, for CT surveillance. Okay, how will you differentiate whether the adrenal is a metastatic spread or just a local extension? Um, if it's local extension, it would be contiguous with the main bulk of the tumor. Um, if it's metastatic, then it wouldn't. Okay, so how will you further arrange this patient's follow-up? What protocol you will follow? Um, I, I'd follow the EAU guidance. Um, I I would have to look it up, but I believe it involves an early CT at three months uh, and then six months, and then it follows on from there. Okay, what advice you will give? Uh, Any specific advice like activities and everything? How will you monitor the blood test? You need to say about uh, he should be good and nicely ambulant as much as possible and uh, you need to monitor his kidney functions, blood test regularly. So those things have to be added in your follow-up. Okay, okay. Okay, good. Anything you want to add before we complete? Uh, no, no, I don't think so, no. Okay, good. So thank you for your time. I hope the discussions are useful. Yeah, they were really useful, thank you.